Matthew McCabe. Welcome to Miracle Voices. Each episode, we will be delving into stories of forgiveness, healing, and transformation that have come about from integrating the principles of the book, A Course in Miracles. If you want to learn more about A Course in Miracles, visit www.acim.org. If you'd like to visit the Miracle Voices site, please go to www.miraclevoices.org. If you feel inspired to make a love offering, please visit us at miraclevoices.org forward slash donate. All donations go to support the work of the Foundation for Inner Peace, the publisher of A Course in Miracles. Now here's your program. Hello, Miracle Voices listeners. This is Matthew McCabe, and I am here with my new co-host, Tam Morgan, co-president of the Foundation for Inner Peace. Tam, how are you doing today? I am doing especially well now that I'm here in the present with you, Matt. Oh, that's great. And and for those that don't know, you're you're also Judy's daughter. So if people don't make also. the connection, we'll make this make that connection now. <laughs> the also is a big word there. Yes. yes. I am I am you know, some of the time I am only Judy's daughter. Yeah. And right now I am also. Well, just so people get a sense of where you are in the world, where are you sitting right now, Tam? Right now I am in on a mountain, on Mount Tam, actually, Tam Pius, um, in Mill Valley, California. Great. Well, T- Tam, this is kind of a, a different episode because um, Judy's passed away. We've had a little bit of time pass. And today we're going to talk about, you know, those those last few days and what it was like and what you witnessed. Because a lot of people are wondering, you know, how yeah. was Judy's transition? What was it like? You know, she was an advanced student of the course. How did she, how was she thinking and what was she talking about? All these things come up. And I thought, what a great episode for, to let you share about that since you were obviously right there with her. Thank you so much. And, um, I, I find it funny even still to say that she's passed away because she still seems to be everywhere. Um, I have had my own personal uh, awareness that I haven't even mourned yet. You know, I'm I'm guessing it will come, but there was so much completion around it that she has, she just is still in everything to me. So she hasn't passed away so much so that when people come into her home and they walk in and they burst into tears, I find myself holding them and saying, I'm sorry for your loss. And you know, we can't help but laugh about it. And I'm very honored that someone would come to her home, you know, and cry for her because she deserves that. The the being ego that was Judy deserved some tears. Um, but that's not what's come for me at, at all. And well, you know, I think it's been it's, an I interesting think- journey. You've just had an unbelievable lot of things going on in your personal life around all this. I mean it's unbelievable to think that you're dealing with this, the death and the aftermath. And I'm, I'm not sure if you want to go into all of it, but you've just had so much, so much going on. And just one detail I can, I'll delete this. If you don't want to tell us, but you just said, and a family of skunks moved into your house and <laughs> sprayed. And then one of the skunks, skunks died in your house. So I was just, I just had to laugh. Cause I was like, yeah. what kind of cherry on top is this? It's, 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 it's almost hilarious. It's like theater of the absurd. It is. And 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 the cherry on top, and we can get to it. So so do remind me. Um, is is truly what did happen afterwards, and uh, to her body, to her actual body, and I I really felt it was all tied in. So so we can actually get to that later. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much you want to hear. It it was integral. There were parts of it that was integral with what was going on with me at, at the same time, but. Um, I can, you just tell me where you want me to start. Well, I mean, I'll start. I think I got a text from you the like three. Th- so she died. On, was it October 19th was the day she passed? Oh, yes, it was. Okay. So mm-hmm. very so, deliberately, she picked that date. So okay. um, well, very maybe deliberately. A, a few days before that, I think I got yeah. a text from you and it was kind of like, hey, it l- looking like it's, soon. Right. And maybe, maybe we can start from there. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to start on. Um, on Thursday, she died on Tuesday and on Thursday, there was a very dear friend of ours who, um, 
was not doing well and um, needed some support and caregiving. And his mother, who was a friend of my mother's um, as well, living in my mother's retirement community, um, was really wanting to give some financial support. And so she said to me, come to me tomorrow morning so I can give a check so that you know, my son can have some care here. And uh, I went the next morning to get that check and the mother actually had fallen and she uh, was in the hospital. And so that was the beginning of this. And she was a friend of my mother's. And as I was going to my mother's to tell her this and report this, um, I got a call from a uh, one of my best friends and uh, her daughter, and they were having a memorial service the next day, which was Saturday. And, and now this was Friday. Um, and they were having a memorial service for their son who had died. And uh, they asked me if I would the person who was going to, going to officiate it uh, could not get to town. And so they asked me if I would officiate it for 80 people. And this is just the next day. And the the son was, I was close to knew him be- since before he was born. So I said, yes. And I'm on the way to my mother's like saying yes to this, knowing that this one person was in the hospital while her son was also sick and all sorts of things going on at once. And I get to my mother's and my mother first thing she looks at me and she says, I I don't think I'm doing very well right now. And, um, I, you know, I need you to know this. And I looked at her and I literally said, mom, can we talk about your death and dying on Sunday? Can we just like put it off for a day and a half? Um, because all of this other stuff is on my plate right now. And tomorrow I have to do you know, this other person's memorial service for 80 people. Can we just put it on hold? And my mother, who is just so amazing, looked at me and said, I'll do the best I can. I'll try. And what I found out later was that um, she was in the midst of a massive heart attack. And uh, I knew she was in pain. She, my mother was able to tolerate the very high levels of pain. And when I say tolerate, I mean, just spiritually override it. And um, she told me she was in quite a lot of pain um, and she was waiting, you know, what we were discussing really was an administering of morphine and how much for her. And she had always, she got it in her mind because she and I were with her mother, uh, my grandmother, uh, when my grandmother died, that she um, that dying of congestive heart failure is a really good way to go because you slowly kind of um, your breathing gets more difficult and you in effect drown, but you're also on morphine, so it's not very painful. And you can you can be somewhat as look as conscious as you really want to be throughout the process until the end. And we held my grandmother and we cheered her on. And my mother said, that's a good way to go. So I'm fine going that way. So I'd always heard this with her. Um, And she, so I knew what she was talking about. I asked her to wait till Sunday. And so she did, but she had a phlebotomist came to her house on Friday because she really wanted to see what was going on. She wasn't clear whether it was her heart or she was having a lot of digestive issues or if it was that something she could still fix. And it ended up that we didn't get the results till Monday. And on Monday, we found out that there is something called, I'm going to say this, pronounce it wrong, but it's like trypanine level in the blood, which measures how much stress the heart is under. And all I can tell you from a very layman's point of view is that, as the doctor said, that the level between one and 47 is normal. And anything above 47, if it's 48, 49, the heart starts being under stress and you're starting to have a mild, kind of a mild heart attack. Um, And then if, as the numbers get higher, it's a bigger heart, heart attack on Friday, when the blood work was taken, she was at a level of 7,098. So the doctor couldn't believe on Monday she was even still here. 
But that was the beginning of the process. And the uh, next day, uh, you know, and, and I was with her Friday and she just wanted to take care of business. We had, you know, a couple of conference calls while I was in bed with her and uh, people were unaware of it. There were some international calls she felt we had to make and she had to finish things up. And I went off to the memorial service on Saturday and she ended up getting dressed with the help of a caregiver and having a Zoom call with, uh, with her beloved husband who deceased, um, his five children. So she had a Whitson family call and she they all said how fabulous she looked and she was on with them for an hour. And when she was off, she was in screaming pain, Um, but they thought she looked fabulous and was doing great. So she had this ability to override the pain when she was being of service, which was just extraordinary. She kept saying that she kept saying, as long as I am working, I don't feel the pain the same. It was her ultimate distraction. So it was hard to gauge, you know, how much pain she was actually in. But I went to the memorial service and a car crashed through a hedge on the outside of the service and broke a water main. And at that moment, I can't explain it any better than that I suddenly felt my mother's death passage had begun like a birth passage when with water breaking. And I, I, in the middle of this kind of craziness um, in the memorial service where everyone was running and screaming, I could feel my mother's passage really beginning. That's all I can say. And, um, and the memorial service got back together and, and no one was actually hurt. Luckily it was a, a, you know, three kids who were, high as kites, um, driving and crashing in, which was all very strange. But um, I left the memorial service. I came home and I was so exhausted. I just, because I'd been up with my mother the whole night before, um, I just fell asleep on my bed in my clothes without even calling her. And within an hour, I got a phone call from her and she was in screaming pain. So I rushed over to her and was with up with her all night. And we did begin to administer a um, very light dose of the morphine. She was in hospice care. So um, this was part of this. She had been in hospice care for eight months and eight months earlier, we really thought she was going to go and she bounced back and hospice care meant um, they were just monitoring her to see how she was doing. So now it was time to step in again. And uh, so Sunday she slept most of the day and seemed to kind of be okay. And, you know, she felt she was really, this was it and she was getting ready to go, but it wasn't that day. That's all I can say. And she insisted that I went home and get some sleep Sunday night and, um, Matt, you can edit any of this out and shorten it, but I'm giving you the full version here. Um, Monday morning, I came back and it was very clear to both of us that she was, she was leaving. So uh, we spoke to her grandson who her eldest grandson, uh, my brother's son, who um, was in Colorado and she had just the most beautiful goodbye. I love you. And I want you to know how much I love you with uh, him and his wife. And then we called, and then she gave me the greatest gift. I got to uh, video record her. uh, And on my iPhone, I guess it's not even called video anymore, but in any case, um, I recorded her very, very clearly saying, I want you to know I am in this much pain, which I am. I'm very clear that I want to go. I feel complete. I feel fulfilled. I want no doctors coming to my rescue, no resuscitation, no hospital. I am clear. 
And I got to send that off to my brother who was in Princeton. So we could be on, on the same page that this was the time. And they had their moment of going. My brother is an MD. So he was seeing all the ways that I could help. But he basically said that she was indeed in, you know, going through heart attack symptoms and that what we were doing for her is just what they would have done in the hospital, which was to give morphine and to um, give oxygen. So we were also monitoring her and how much we were giving her. And um, I could feel her starting to ride out. I had been with my grandmother in the same situation and the breathing changes and you hear different things. So, so she and I were both aware and knowing of this. But what I'm going to go backwards just a little bit. And you asked the things she was thinking of before. My mother for really eight months was um, was finishing up. And she finishing up meant she would never, ever finish her work with the foundation. So because it was ongoing and there was always something she could do, but she was backing off. Um, in a lot of the running of things. So Matt, her, you know, you know, two of her favorite things, her absolute favorite things that completely had her not feel pain, what were these podcasts that you two were doing together, which she adored, and would show up for continuously. And um, sometimes I couldn't believe she would show up because she was in so much pain before them. And no one knew she could disguise it. Uh, the other were these symphony calls with our volunteers. And she was so moved that we, the foundation came to a place where we have volunteers. And she's so touched by this group that she showed up every Friday for this call, um, a Zoom call. And it ended up being tremendously meaningful to her and powerful as well. So she But other than that, she really was being more of a consultant when I would ask her, okay, so what do we do about this and that? And we would ask together. And I kept saying, I can't imagine you leaving me with all this. And she kept saying, you will be ready. I won't leave until you can do this. And with such a funny, funny promise. Um, But that's where she came from. I will not leave until I see it in a way where it's actually better for you if I'm not here. And we had very, very honest conversations about, for instance, what that meant. So she took care of her mother. My grandmother took care of her mother before her, my great-grandmother. And we were very aware of the devotion and the, the service that it meant to take care of one's parent. And my mother was so aware of it, she insisted we not live together. She wanted that space and fortunate um, fortunate enough to have a caregiving policy that she got years ago so she could have caregivers attend to her body, which she does not want me to do. I mean, there were times that I definitely did do it, but she preferred to make it as clean as possible between us. And she committed to, before leaving, having our relationship be guilt-free. And we had a beautiful, beautiful relationship, but we definitely had snags here and there and picture a care, you know, the daughter turning into the mother because I had to take care of her body and there were certain things she could no longer do anymore. And I can be bossy and officious. (laughs) and, um, And, you know, I had to learn where I was robbing her of her independence just to keep her safe so that I didn't have to do more work. Um, And sometimes, you know, I I got her an electric wheelchair and when she was, when she needed to take some opiates at some time, it was like giving, you know, a drunk driver a car. Uh, And, you know, she, she actually hurt herself. So, so we did have, we did have moments where I would get frustrated or angry, like, what are you doing? And what are you thinking? And, and sometimes she was completely in the place of, of what I would say justified because I came in too overpowering 
and to learn how to back off and give her her independence. No one really knew this. Well, a few people did around her, but her eyesight was starting to fail. So in the background, I changed everything around her to uh, voice activated. And it became overwhelming in itself because the Alexa would fight with Moshi, which was an old system, and they would talk to each other and say, I don't understand it in the middle of the night. <laughs> and it became full of humor. But she she really did have this whole system that was able to work for her. But then her internet would go down and nothing did work for her. And there were just those kind of challenges as she was saying, you know, you're you're over technology, over technology. I, I don't even know the word for it, giving me too much technology, <laughs> overtaking me. Um, and uh, and yet I wanted everything to be okay for her for the, the times and the hours that I wasn't there. So we had a balance and I was feeling guilty around that, holding guilt that I needed to leave. I had a partner who I also needed to give some time to. And she just looked at me and said, we need to leave guilt-free. And she was having um, some issues with one of her caregivers who she did not, uh, she did not want to release. And even though she was having some, some relationship problems, she kept saying, this is one of my biggest lessons. And instead of, she was using and practicing the course continually and things kept backfiring and uh, it wasn't, good. There was parts of it that were almost even elder abuse. Uh, And she was putting up with things that she didn't like putting up with for herself. And again, I digress for one thing that I need to say here, because this is what the story is about, is my mother was able to make every single person on this planet feel loved that she met. Eh, Maybe not everyone, but a look much, much, much of uh, her company and the people, you know, someone said she'd never met a stranger. Um, She really could make people comfortable and she had a unique ability to make people feel loved and really loved, but she never gave that love to herself. She was always doing and trying and being and caring for others. And she didn't exercise a day in her life traditional formal exercise. And she, except she ran around everywhere uh, doing things, but she did not take care of herself, except if her body got sick, then she'd pay attention to it. You know, they're okay. She'd go online and research everything online of what she had. And her doctor had volumes that my mother had given him on herself and um, micromanaged her own health care, but basically really taking care of herself and loving herself. She didn't. And she wanted to change that before she left. And so the combination of wanting she and me to leave get our relationship guilt-free and this caregiver situation made my mother decide that at age 89, she wanted to go into therapy. And when I asked her what kind of therapist, she said she didn't want someone in the course world. She wanted to deal with herself as a human ego and really work through some stuff on that level. And so I found her this really extraordinary geriatric caregiver uh, uh, therapist. And she began these therapy sessions and uh, it she loved this. If anyone has ever said you can't teach an old dog new tricks, you know, being watching what my mother went through during these past months was unbelievable. She went from being someone who would say, you know, and, and she had some genetic you know, predisposition to being a Jewish mother, which meant in stereotypical terms that she would say something like, um, I'd come back from having been gone Saturday night and Sunday. And she'd say, did you have a good time? And I said, yes, it really was a nice time. And she said, oh, I'm so glad because I just worked the whole time and then was in pain and up all night. And that would give me guilt. And and it was an interesting moment because sure, it's my guilt and I could work on that myself and release it. But 
I'm very confrontational. My mother is very not. And I said to her, you know, that makes me experience guilt. And it's very Jewish mothery to me. And she took it on. And she said, you know, you're right. There's no reason to put it like that. And let me see if I can change. Let me see if my comments, these side comments that sound like digs to you um, or are guilt provoking. Let me see what I can do to change that. And I was completely blown away that she took that on and didn't say, you know, honey, work on it because that's not what I mean. Um, And she changed the way that she would say things so that it became her saying to me, honey, did you have a nice time this weekend? And I would say, yes, it was really nice. And she would say, that makes me so happy. I am so glad you had a good time. And then I would say, you know, how have you been? And her response was, you know, I worked a lot and I was in a lot of pain, but it's my pain. It's not yours. And this is my, one of my last lessons. And it's for me to work out and go through and none of it do I put on you. And I cannot tell you how happy it makes me to know that you had a good time so that you can come back and we can deal with this together. And I love you for that. Thank you. And it, it was exceptionally transformative for both of us and my work too, alongside partnering. What do I do to honor you? What do you need? What do you want most? Um, How can I be of help instead of hindrance to you in this process? And how do we balance what feels comfortable for me, for your safety that you're taking care of versus what you want to do and override anything that's might be healthy for yourself right now. Um, And her explaining to me, the times that she would go on a call where I would say, oh, please just rest. She would explain, no, I, I hear that I'm to do this. And when I'm doing this, I don't think of my pain. So later there would be a price to pay if she showed up for people, you know, for several hours, someone would come visit and we thought it would be an hour and it was six hours, but it was worth it to her. So I had to back off that way. So this is some backstory of the work that was going on. And she, with this therapist, she would make remarks like, I love that my therapist has me name things. And I would say, well, name things like what? And she said, well, that I'm old. Like I am an old woman and that comes with different things. And I am departing this world and there are stages of grief and the therapist said, you know, you're in a process of dying, which includes these stages of grief. And my mother's response is, I was friends with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and I know all about that firsthand. And the therapist would say, you know, well, if you do, you know, there's different stages of that. And my mother would say, but I'm not angry at all. And I'm not in denial at all. I know this is happening. And the therapist said, yes, because of your spiritual practice, because of your consciousness, you do know these things. That's wonderful. But you are feeling sadness. And my mother said, it's true. I feel these moments of tremendous depression. And I don't know what it's about because I feel like I have such a complete life and I've done everything and I love the people in my life and I'm so grateful. And the therapist says, yes, but Don't you think there's anything that you're grieving? My mother said, I don't see what I feel complete. And the therapist said, is there anyone that you think you might miss when you go? And my mother burst into tears, burst into tears. And she said, yes, I'd miss my daughter. I'd miss my grandson. I'd miss my son. And the therapist, yeah, that's part of the grieving process here. So my mother loved naming things. And saying, this is what that is. So it's okay. And I can come around it in a different way and not be mystified and say why she felt before that being depressed was a betrayal of her spiritual practice. And this way she got it. Oh, my ego is mourning me, leaving my my family. Oh, of course, that's okay. Okay, ego, you do that. And um, it she was much more accepting of her uh, human 
process. And it's why she was actually kind of glad that the the therapist who knew about A Course in Miracles and had even worked um, with Jerry Jampolsky at one point at the the Attitudinal Healing Center um, was not a course student. And for this purpose, she liked that um, because they could speak the language, but she didn't want to be a persona. She didn't want to be someone going, oh, you're Judy Scotch Whitson and how amazing. And I can't believe I get to treat you. This woman did not know my mother. So it was really lovely for her. So that's one piece of what was going on and the work that she was really doing in the background. So as we moved through this eight months, um, she was really effectively in different ways, pulling back, being more consultant than an active, um, organizer, organizer within the foundation, um, in the running of it to watch how it was run and to feel comfortable. And she was so excited about what we were doing at the foundation because we're shifting the organization from top down to, um, you know, with my mother, it was just, as she called it, the three-legged stool of her, you know, Bob Scutch and uh, her husband, Wit, um, ex-husband, Bob Scutch. Uh, and now, you know, we had staff and people of 16 and then we have volunteers and navigating all of this it's very different and watching that we switched from top down to truly an empowerment of team work together and support and um and seeing that it was working and she just kept being so touched by how much it was working and how it was growing in this way. And she was really excited um, about just stepping back and cheering people on and being this consultant, uh, which Bob Scutch is doing as well at age 96. And he's still alive, helping us in so many ways. Uh, So anyway, so moving back to the Monday of her passing, she was feeling really good about what was going on in the organization, what was going on with me, what was going on between us. Um, We were clean. Both of us were clean. We'd worked through all of that stuff and it was just so beautiful. And she just said, I'm, I'm ready. I don't want to be in this pain. And as I say, the gift of that recording was so fantastic because there was a couple of times later that I played it and went, huh, she really did want that, right? But the fact was, you know, as I said, like the the administering of the morphine was just helpful to her. She was indeed going as well. It just assisted her. Uh, but it really was good to have that complete clarity that she had. So Here she is. She knows she's passing now. She said goodbye to her son and her grandson. Her youngest grandson um, had just come out. And so he was with her. And she had always said to me that her favorite day in the world was, um, was when my son was born. And with my brother, my mother had a very difficult labor and was got very sick afterwards. And with me, she had a miraculous moment of recognition. But with my son, I had invited her into the birthing room and she found it to be the most, as she would put, the most extraordinary um, moment of her life. Mo- I mean, night of her life being on the other end and seeing life happen. And she was so moved. And when my son Lige was born, um, he was in distress. He had the umbilical cord wrapped around him twice, uh, his neck. And so he immediately went and was cared for and they were caring for me. And he was born, um, you know, closer to a quarter after three. But by the time everything was fine with him, they were still doing things to me and they handed my son to my mother. And it was a moment, it was four in the morning. um, And it, she called him her four o'clock, 4am baby for a while after that. Um, And 
this was important to her always of that moment um, when he was born. So on Monday, my son was with her and he was all cuddled up in bed with her. And um, she turned to us and she said, would you two mind if I don't go until tomorrow? And it was such a funny question, but I knew why she was asking it. The next day was my son's birthday. And he did not want her going on his birthday because he didn't want to remember his birthday always as the day his favorite person in the world died. And they were exceptionally close and really, really deeply close. And um, But because she was asking to, it meant that the, there would be about at least 12 more hours of her there. And, you know, how, how was he going to say no? And he, he said, yes, it's fine. And I knew she was asking for a holy reason. Uh, and I nodded and, you know, of course, so we knew we had the afternoon evening together and it was a really beautiful thing to know. So we could really complete in every possible way. So the next thing that happened was really watching her shift in her awareness and watching her start to go. And uh, we would talk. We were talking in between. She would she would be up to talk and then she'd fall asleep for a little while and then she'd be up again in pain and sometimes she'd scream. And she looked at me and she said, honey, pay no attention to the pain that my body is inflicting. It is not me. And that pain is kicking me out because this is my time. And I can't say it more clearly. I would not leave otherwise. It knows it. I would still override. I would work. I would be here. Um, But it's my time. So it's kicking me out to serve that which needs to be. So don't be mad at my body for this and don't get attached to the pain. I have never felt more calm and more loving in my entire life. And I've never felt this much peace. Um, And what that allowed me to do was instead of, you know, cringing and being upset at any given moment when she was screaming, I got to kiss her body all over and stroke it and massage it and love it and cheer it on and say, good body. Thank you. Thank you for taking care of my mother all these years. Thank you for enduring the pain that she, you know, would spiritually override. Thank you for taking the hits for her. Thank you for keeping her her here till age 90 without her ever having exercised you. Thank you for doing your job so beautifully um, and for doing this job and just the ability to love and honor the body's work that that was a partner of hers as well, doing its job. And it was extraordinary. And she was grateful for that attitude instead of me connecting with her in the pain even when she screamed, it was like, good scream, body, good scream, mom. And then the light coming out of her eyes was just getting bigger and bigger. And then she just started, I could feel she just started to be more of that. Um, And I said to her, "Um, you're going to be what she always said to me, you're going to be meeting wit her husband and grandma, her mother, my, my grandmother. And she said, "Hmm, I don't know. And I said, what do you mean? I don't, you don't know. Like she said, that's story. And I don't, this is different than I thought. Um, I don't need story anymore. And it was deeply profound. She said, I don't know anything, but it wasn't, I'm scared, or I I don't know if they'll really be there. So I'm going to be defensive and protect myself. It doesn't matter. I'm on this journey. It wasn't that at all. It was very deeply, 
if something else is coming in and I don't need that, I don't not need it, I don't know. And she had been working a lot with the I don't know towards the end as well. You know, that all the things that she did know, she was letting go of knowing. And so the next conversation, again, it was the, this is, this is different than I thought. And I don't know. And I don't need any, any stories now. And I said, what about the course? And she said, even that. And she smiled and then she fell asleep again. And I read to her the passage um, in lesson 189 of forget these words, forget this course. And I'm always, I'm so bad at remembering it exactly, but, um, and walk holy into, walk with me holy unto God. That's the gist of it. Um, and I read the passages to her as she was going. Um, but as she got deeper and deeper, she did exactly that. She let go of even the course and started to become this incredible, incredible presence of um, what was surprising to me was it was love, but it was peace. And, you know, maybe there's an aspect to it. She was given morphine as well, but I've been with a lot of people who've died who've been given morphine. This was a different quality. And she was getting deeper and deeper into it. And her last words to me, um, her last words were to my son, but her last words to me was she said, honey, I could not want for anything. You've given me everything I could ever want and more. I've never felt so fully loved. And I feel finally completely loved by me too. Miracle Voices listeners, please tune in next week for part two of this episode with Tam. Thanks so much for listening today. Please subscribe to Miracle Voices by hitting the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you are enjoying these conversations, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. And lastly, please visit us at miraclevoices.org and join our newsletter so we can stay connected. Until the next podcast, I want to leave you with my favorite course quote, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Nothing else.